All right, everybody. My name is Robert Hale, and I'm a first-year student at MIT Sloan, and I'm here to introduce Stan Honey, who's with the 34th America's Cup. He's the director of technology. Uh, you probably know Stan from his innovation in developing the first down uh, yellow line for the NFL and the K zone for the M uh, Major League Baseball. Today he's uh, here to talk about his newest work with the America's Cup. Uh, it's called Live Line, and it actually takes graphic images and superimposes them on top of live television to give the viewer more technical information about the sport. So with that, I'll turn it over to Stan. So briefly, I'll describe the event and then get on to the interesting technical bits. It's the America's Cup sailing event. It's the longest running sailing event in the history of mankind, I think. Um, it's been sailed for 160 years, but in the next version, it's going to be sailed in um, catamarans, wing-masted catamarans. And there's a um, series called the America's Cup World Series that's running this year and next year where there's um, about nine events in each series and these are scattered around the world. When the actual America's Cup happens, starting in 2013, the votes will be changed to the America's Cup 72s. And as you can see, they're about twice as big with about four times the sail area and eight times the power. So these boats are going to be absolutely frightening, particularly because they're going to start to race them in the spring in San Francisco, where it's uh, very windy. This is the system that I want to talk about. This is a, um, a frame grab from the live video. And you can see what we do is the kinds of things that, um, as has been mentioned, I've you know, done before in my career. I was the founder of Sport Vision. And the other systems that were mentioned were pioneered by Sport Vision. And what Sport Vision does and what augmented reality does is it takes things that are important to an event that happen a lot and are hard to see and makes them easy to see. So in the case of a sailing event, we've got those problems in spades. Whereas the normal sailing event, when you look at it from helicopter video, you see sailboats on the water. Um, as David Hill would say, you see white triangles and a blue background. And it doesn't really look like a sporting event. But by inserting graphics into the live video, you can make it look like a sporting event, and you can make it understandable for folks that are new to sailing. So in this case, this again is a, a snapshot from live video. And I'll show some live video in a minute. But the elements that we've inserted are the red boundary around the edge of the race course. You can see the uh, black and white um, finish line. I might have a pointer here. You can see the black and white checkered finish line. And then there's a three boat length circle around the mark. Three boat lengths is important for sailors because the rules change at a mark when the closest boat is within three boat lengths of the mark. And then you can see the labels, you know, identifying which boat is which. The heritage of this system um, dates back to about 94 when we started the development of the the tracked and highlighted hockey puck. This was a project, I was um, at the time head of technology for News Corp, and this was done by the News Technology Group. The group of folks that did that ended up uh, leaving News Corp and we founded Sport Vision. That's the puck, that's the follow-on system. This was the yellow first down line that we introduced at Sport Vision in 2000. The K-Zone and the motorsport system. This is the Sport Vision motorsport system, which is the closest ancestor to the current America's Cup system. The uh, Sport Vision motorsport system shares the tracking technology, which uses carrier phase GPS that measures the position of the race cars five times a second to two centimeters. And we use basically the same technology as that, the carrier phase GPS closely coupled with a six axis IMU. But the thing we do in sailing that's much, much tougher than anything that we had the good sense to take on at Sport Vision is we insert the graphics and video that's taken from a helicopter. So most of the Sport Vision systems, we inserted graphics and cameras that were tripod mounted, where it was relatively straightforward to measure the pan and tilt of the camera. In the case of the sailing system, the camera's in a helicopter. So it's much, much tougher. 
this is uh, one of the Olympic systems we did at Sport Vision, and as I recall, we were criticized for having tripped the Canadian skater, <laughs> even though, of course, we inserted the, uh, the flags. So this is the helicopter. The camera is that um, the Cineflex ball camera that you see. It's been modified to have very accurate sensors that measure its pan and tilt relative to the helicopter. And then the electronics package is that white cube of electronics that's mounted on the same bracket as the helicopter. That measures the position of the helicopter to within two centimeters, five times a second. But it also measures the attitude of the helicopter to a hundredth of a degree. And then we have other sensors that measure the attitude of the camera relative to the helicopter to a hundredth of a degree. And as many of you know, it's hard to measure an angle on a piece of paper to a hundredth of a degree. So this was a real challenge. It turns out to um, have caused a unique set of problems also, which is by the time we got it to where we could register imagery from a helicopter um, that accurately on the ground, the US government informed us that this was now under ITAR control. So in order to move this gear around the world, we takes lots of special permission. This is the gear on the boats themselves. So the black Pelican case is basically the navigation system and the computer system. The gray Pelican case is the, uh, the power supply. That's a battery that's about a kilowatt hour of power. There's two other Pelican cases that ride in the other hull in the catamaran. There's one that uh, is the audio system for the mics on each of the sailors, and then the other one is the video system. There's four cameras on each boat that can be remotely panned, tilted, zoomed, and focused. So the black Pelican case contains the, uh, the carrier phase GPS, the six axis IMU, the computer, and it not only does the tracking, but it also provides various communications that are used for the race committee communications, and it provides the control of the cameras for pan and tilt of the cameras. The race committee communications takes place through this device. This is what they call the RO comms for race officer communications. There's one of these displays in front of the helmsman position on each hull of the catamaran. The um, sailors can use this to file a protest so they can push the yellow button for a Y flag protest or press the red button for B flag protest. And then on the display they can see the, they can see the fact that they filed a protest. They can see when some other boat in the race files a protest. The upper left, they can see the start time for the race. In the upper center is their penalty count. And in the upper right is their distance to the limit. So those limits you saw in the previous graphic. That's the back of the AC-45 catamaran. The, um, camera, you can see one of the four cameras at the top of that antenna tower. And there's four of those on board the boat, but that is the camera that's remotely panned and tilted and zoomed and focused from, you know, through the computer system. And then that tray that's forward of that antenna tower is the uh, carrier phase GPS antenna. This is how sailing used to be rendered on TV. This is a fully virtual view of the race. This is done by Virtual Eye, um, Ian Taylor's company. It's done using the data that we capture, using the hardware that you saw, and it's rendered entirely virtually. So it's basically a video game rendering of the race. Um, this has some advantages and disadvantages relative to the augmented reality. One thing that's difficult about it is you have to render everything. You've got to render the shore, the water, all of the sails, all of that. The disadvantage of it is that a lot of the data is made up. So if a boat's falling behind because it has broken a head solar or they've broken a halyard, you can't see that in the virtual rendering because there's no sensors on it. The other thing that's frustrating to sailors looking at the virtual rendering is that you can't see the wind and the water because the water is made up, so you can't see the puffs, and you can't tell who's about to start pulling ahead. But the virtual rendering has a big advantage, too, which is it can render anything, whereas the augmented reality rendering, where we draw into the real video, we can only show what the helicopter captured. And so if there's a pass or a collision that took place on a part of the race course that the helicopter didn't see, well, the only way to, to view that is using the virtual viewer. So we use both in the America's Cup.
but again, they're both driven from the same set of data. And the virtual rendering, which was first done starting in 92 in the America's Cup in San Diego, is working much, much better than ever before by virtue of the two centimeter data. So I'm gonna show a few, if it starts, I will show a few um, video grabs from a live broadcast and I'll just talk through so you can s and describe what some of the insertions are. If it starts. There we go. So there you can see the limits, the red line around the outside. This is the start of the race. There you can see the starting line. There's one boat that's gonna be over early. The, the tracking system is used to determine OCS, which stands for on the course side of the start. And the, the question was, would another boat file a protest? And in the case of an OCS, they don't have to. In the case of all of the other infractions, another boat has to file a protest. So even though the umpires see a foul, they can't assign a penalty unless the boat protests. But for an OCS, uh, the race officer assigns the protest. Here you can see two boats labeled, Team Korea and a left. You can see the three boat link circles around the marks. There you can see three other boats and you can see the red limit. Those white lines that look like yard lines are in fact the head behind lines and they're 100 meters apart. So in this case you can see that Spittle was 62 meters ahead of Team New Zealand and then those reference white lines that are 100 meters apart um, also confirm that estimate. There, that yellow line in the bottom is the lay line. So those yellow lines are the lay lines at which a boat could tack and come close to laying the mark. Now imagine what this would look like without the inserted graphics. You're back to the you know, sailboats on the water and it's very hard to envision who's ahead, who's behind, or what the story is. So this is a huge tool for the commentators to be able to tell the story of the race. This is a match race. In a match race, the start is much more complicated because you have entry requirements where the boats have to enter the, basically the cage fight within a certain window of time. And it's very difficult to explain without the graphics, you know, what the entry requirements are. So there you can see that without those entry graphics, it would be almost impossible to interpret what's going on. In this case, you'll see that uh, Artemis is gonna enter just about a second too early. And Artemis is assigned a penalty for an early entry here. This is again one of those penalties that the competitor doesn't have to protest. It gets filed by the, in this case, by the umpires. The real starting line is. Say again. And the lines can be reading that would when they arrived. Yes, right at two minutes. The, the question was when was the entry requirement? It was right at two minutes, and we change the color of the lines on the water at the instant when it's permitted or required to change them. In fact, the starting line changes color from red to white, the instant of the start. There you can see one of the lower helicopters. The live line helicopter is always the highest helicopter. And, and if you're a sailor, you can see the wind and the water from the high, line, the, the high helicopter. And that's a huge benefit for the sailors in the audience to be able to see the puffs on the water as well as see the ley lines to clearly know which mark is which. It makes the race much easier to understand. 
So there you see the 70 meter ahead behind graphic. And you can see the trails behind the boats in the water. We actually were criticized in Plymouth for dropping ink off the boats and polluting the water so that we were flattered with that. So there's the finish line, again, the, the checkered finish line. And as in previous augmented reality systems that we've done at Sport Vision, the boats sail over the graphics, and that's um, much tougher than it sounds. We also use the system and the tools for the running of the race. And it's interesting that in sailing, the um, sailing has embraced the use of the data to actually manage the race and to officiate the event much, much more quickly than other sports that I've been involved in. So this is a screenshot of the computer screen from the principal race officer. And what he does is the race course is the end of those black line segments. He grabs them with his mouse and he can pull them wherever he wants. The course limits are that red polygon around the outside. He can grab e any of those vertices and drag it wherever he wants. And then when he presses commit, those locations are instantly sent to his mark boats and to his marshal boats. And they show up on the chart plotters on those boats as waypoints. The boats are dynamically positioned. They're not anchored. So as soon as he presses commit, his mark boats will be off at 25 knots to their new location. And so he's able to change the race course you know, within a minute. And this addresses one of the problems that sailing has had on TV in the past, which is if you get a wind shift and they postpone in order to remove the marks, it can take a half an hour or more to anchor all the marks. And in this case, um, John Craig, the uh, principal race officer, is able to change the race course within a minute. This is the other screen that the principal race officer uses. On the left, he takes all of his marks and he's able to assign his motorboats to them by name. He's able to assign the direction of rounding. He's able to assign a motorboat to the gate boat, define the zone around the mark. On the upper right, he selects which boats are in the race. And then he's further able to select whether it's a fleet race or a match race, the race number and the start time. And then when he presses that commit button, that data goes everywhere. It goes to TV, it goes to the umpires, it goes to the course marshals, and it goes to the race boats themselves. And if John has made a mistake, his, uh, he starts to hear about it on a radio within seconds. This is the umpiring booth, and this is completely unique in sailing. Umpiring up until now has been always done on the water. In the America's Cup, the umpires are split. There's the booth umpires, and there's the uh, on the water umpires. And the way they split the work is the booth umpires make the objective determinations of fact, whether there was an overlap at the instrument of zone entry, whether it was OCS, whether there's a limit violation. And the on the water umpires make the determinations that are subjective, like did a boat have room and opportunity to keep clear. So this is, this is a um, screen grab of what the umpires are looking at. So in this case, there's a boat, Oracle 4, and he got to the three boat length zone before there was an overlap, so Oracle 5 is not entitled for room at that mark. Oracle 5 took room at the mark. I'm sorry, I have the number swapped. Oracle 4 took room at the mark, and so he will be assigned a penalty, and in this case, Oracle 5 did protest. So this is a replay of the same instant. Notice the instant that Oracle 5 gets to the three boat length circle, the color changes so the umpires can see. There's a uh, perpendicular line drawn, so it's very clear there was not an overlap. And Oracle 4 is going to stuff it in there anyway. Now, these other boats are the umpires that are on the water. So that's a jet ski. 
with an umpire on it, and that's a high-speed high rib with an umpire on it. And so the umpire in the booth is able to talk to those guys on the radio during this event, and they're having this continuous discussion about what's happening as they make their determination. It turned out to operate the jet ski in these kinds of sea states. They had to hire US Navy SEALs to show them how to run the jet skis. And then they discovered it was easier to teach the SEALs how to umpire than it was to teach the umpires how to drive the jet ski. So they used US Navy SEALs as umpires. This is a, another incident. This one is interesting. At the left, you see the start line. The wind is coming from the top. So it's a reaching start. These boats are all on starboard, so they have right of way. This boat is coming in on port. Now you can see a black arrow coming off the boats. That arrow indicates their instantaneous course and speed. That's where they will be in five seconds if they maintain their current course and speed. But you can get a feeling for the motion of the boat. So there he's tacking onto starboard right in front of the fleet. But he screws up. It's very windy here. He loses the tack. He goes back onto port right in front of the fleet. This guy is not able to keep clear, so there's a collision. Turns out this guy isn't able to keep clear either, and so he similarly collides. So this was about a $200,000 tack that that guy failed to make. I'll show a close-up. This is the first one. So this is uh, the first boat who's trying, who's going to try to tack onto port. You can see from his vector, he loses way, starts to go backward. I'm sorry, he was going to tack onto starboard. He loses way, goes backward, falls back onto port, and then here's a collision. Now note that collision. This boat inserted himself into that boat by about a foot. I'll show you the actual imagery later, and you can see how accurate the tracking is. But the tracking is accurate to two centimeters. One other comment on the track, on the umpiring I'll mention now is in sailing, after every day of racing, there's an umpire wrap-up, typically that evening. And in normal sailing, the all the skippers get into this umpire wrap-up, and the umpire goes through the events and talks about what's happening. And in normal sailing, this is a very antagonistic discussion because you're competing against your friends, but you're calling each other liars because the problem in sailing has always been in these protests. You argue about what the facts were, what happened. And in these umpire wrap-ups, the chief umpire brings in these exact screenshot and replays the event. And all the sailors look at it, and there's a long silence. And then finally, somebody puts their hand up, and they says, yep, I own that one. And then what you get is a fascinating discussion about the rules. But there's never any argument about the facts. And it's, it's absolutely changed the dynamic of sailing at the world level. So this is the um, actual video of that same collision. So you can see that's the first collision right there. You can see that boat stuffed itself into that boat, just the amount that the computer showed. And then this one also shows the second collision. So in this case, this boat decides he wants to stay above, but his jib stays sheeted in all the way. He's not able to stay up, so he bears off and then runs right into the back of this guy, right under him. and then. Watch the skipper of this boat. And this was the boat that caused all the trouble. Keep watching him. Keep watching this guy. There is no water. So data, as I mentioned, um, sailing has adopted the use of the system very aggressively for the officiating of the event. And the officiating is based largely on the data. The other thing that sailing has done that's interesting with respect to other sports 
is that they've taken a very, very aggressive approach with respect to making the data available. So this is just a screenshot of the America's Cup website. This is the public website that's available to everybody. And after every regatta, all of the data is posted. And it typically we get it posted within an hour of the finish. And that's the full log file of the five hertz data, two centimeter accuracy, the wind measurements, everything. For all the mark boats, all of the sailboats, the protests, the penalties, the entire event is captured in these data files. And it's posted you know, on the web within an hour or so. Then the other thing we do, and it's documented in this area, is we have a live server so that actually during the race, the full precision data that you saw in the umpiring and the full precision data that we use to insert the graphics is actually streamed live on the internet so that if somebody wants to build a viewer for the data, they can. And this is a uh, incredibly far-sighted use by an organizing authority of the use of data. And there are people that are building applications. There's a course at Stanford that is focusing on applications for iPhones. They're building an iPhone viewer so that people will be able to view the race on their iPhone during a race. There's people building augmented reality viewers where you can point your iPhone at a given boat and see who it is and its time delay line and its distance behind leader. And the teams are, of course, using this data like mad to analyze their own performance and compare it to the other boat's performance and to work out the fastest way to attack and the fastest, most efficient way to pay off penalties and so forth. And it's interesting that the teams were at first rattled when we stated our intention to publish the data. And it's very different than previous cups. In previous cups, the data has all been kept secret and all of the challengers were very worried that the defender was somehow going to take better access, take better advantage of the data than anybody else and would somehow get access to it. But when we stated our intention to publish all the data, all of the teams thought about it for a while and then were delighted with this approach because they can't imagine how the defender can have better access to the data if all of the data is being published immediately during the event. So all of the teams felt relaxed that this was, in fact, the only way to be absolutely even-handed for the teams. And they've all embraced it. And it's interesting, the better funded teams like this approach because they assume they have more analysts and they'll get more out of the data. And the least well funded teams like this approach too because they figure they can go to school on the better funded teams and catch up. So it's interesting that it's been um, very well received by the teams as well as um, by the fans. This is. Um, some, just a screenshot of the software that we make available for free, you know, in source code, so that we don't provide viewers and stuff for use of the data, but what we, we do provide is the software tools so that people can download the data and they can see the streaming tables of data so they can convince themselves that it's real. The data really is there, it's easy to interpret. And then what they can do is they can take our source code and then modify it and build their own graphics and do whatever they choose with the data. But we published enough software, we gave away enough software on the website so that people can open it, run it, convince themselves that the data is there and then build on it for their own applications if they choose. And then on the website, we run our server all the time. So when there isn't a live race going on, we just put it in a replay mode so it's constantly replaying races, a previous race, so that uh, people who want to can use that to test their, uh, their viewers. The future, a couple of things we're looking at doing in the future, one of them is to render on the water the current. This is particularly important in San Francisco Bay where the current is strong enough to make a significant difference to the sailing. So we've, uh, we have a detailed model of the current and then we'll be rendering this on the water to allow the commentators to tell the story of where's the ebb and where's the flood. Then the other thing we're working on doing again for the uh, future events in San Francisco is to be able to render into the live video where the disturbed air is that comes off the sailboats. And this is something we have done in um, NASCAR for ESPN. And for sailing, it'll be particularly interesting because even skilled sailors, their intuition isn't very good on where the bad air on these boats is. And the reason is that these boats go downwind faster than the wind. 
So most sailors think that if you're behind on a run and the boats are going downwind, that the boats behind can give bad air to the boat in front. But in these boats, you can't. Because the boats are going downwind faster than the wind, even on a run, the boat ahead can give bad air to the boat behind. So rendering this is going to be a very interesting thing, not just for non-sailors, but even for experienced sailors. So that concludes my uh, prepared comments. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yeah. Um, you know, I think the analytics component is fascinating, but I think what you're doing with it in terms of telling the story um, is the next level to it. And I was wondering, do you see a system like this opening up? So we have a sport like sailing, which before technology was a total non-spectator sport. What about sports? The immediate uh, example that comes to mind would be rowing. You know, you have Heather Charles in Boston, 300,000 spectators, um, something like a hundred, uh, uh, 1,500 volunteers alone or something like that. Um, but no stories told because there's no way to connect and engage the spectator. Do you see a system like this being able to open up uh, a spectator market to a sport like rowing? Yeah, there's a couple of questions I think that were asked there. One is, you know, can this technology of inserting graphics into video be used, you know, in other sports? And the, and the answer there is absolutely. And you know, Sport Vision has done a number of sports through the years, and looking back on it, you know, all of the, the most successful systems have been one where there's something that's really important to the sport that happens a lot and is hard to see. Sailing, you know, there's a ton of examples of that. Rowing, you know, would, would also be true. The ability to run these kinds of systems from a helicopter is something that um, was very challenging to develop. We developed it, you know, working with Sport Vision. You know, Sport Vision has the right to use that for other sports. And uh, sports that come to mind would be, you know, sports like rowing, marathons, road rally, triathlons, bicycle racing, but anything that's routinely produced from a helicopter, you could insert graphics, you know, into the world to make things, to make difficult things that are hard to see easier to see. Have you been talking to ISAF at all about incorporating this into World Cup and Olympic sailing? Wow, there's a sailor. Um, yes, we have. Um, ISAF, I'm on the ISAF technology committee. ISAF is the International Sailing Federation. Um, ISAF has been impressed that, you know, with the two centimeter accuracy, you can actually use this for, you know, OCS determination and overlap determination and the umpiring is, um, is rock solid. Um, and we have spoken to ISAF about building smaller version of the trackers. And we, we could build trackers that were the size and weight of a paperback book. In fact, at Sport Vision, we built prototypes of that for horse racing. And those same trackers would work very well for dinghy sailing. And a system like that for um, dinghy sailing, you could use at the uh, ISAF World Cups for the medal race, and you could use it at the Olympics for the medal race. It's probably not affordable to use for the racing outside of the medal race. And the reason for that, for the non-sailors in the group, is that the medal race, the fleet is a manageable size of you know, typically 10 boats. Whereas some of the other races in a World Cup, you can have giant fleets. And so it would be probably a stretch to afford two centimeter tracking for a large fleet. Are you guys uh, directly work with vision type related spectator issues or do you guys also partner with, um, you know, for example, like Formula One, if they want to do uh, data collection or they, I assume, just do that all themselves? I'm sorry, ask that again. Our relationship with Sport Vision is that Sport Vision has the rights for everything I've shown outside of water sports. And then um, the America's Cup Event Authority has you know, rights within water sports. Um, the Event Authority, this particular project, it was absolutely the enhancement of TV that justified it and justified the investment. Once we 
made the investment uh, unique to sailing. The folks that run the event, the race management group and the folks that umpire the event, um, aggressively adopted a very, very um, thorough use of the data for the running and the umpiring of the event. But frankly, had that been the only requirement, they, couldn't, they wouldn't have invested this level of investment in it because in sailing there are alternatives. You can umpire from the water and it's difficult and it's not always right, but you know, it's, you can do it. And so in this case, the, the system was justified and paid for by the TV enhancement, but they've um, made very aggressive use of it for the umpiring. And the umpiring is really challenging in these boats. That if it, you saw, it's a reaching start. The boats are going 25 knots. Each boat has two hulls and then a prod in front. And on the race committee boat, and I've been on the race committee boat a number of times for the starts, you'll have you know, six or eight experienced um, umpires and sailors on the race committee boat, and none of them can agree who was over and by how much. And then the computer you know, comes up with a result, and nobody agrees with that either. And then you go back to the high-speed camera, and you parse through it, and you find the right field. And of course, you discover that the computer was right. So, um, but nevertheless, um, in sailing, whether the answer is right or not, there has been a policy where you just come up with an answer by the umpire, and the official's always right. Hi, um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the effect of this technology on, say, um, print um, publishing and, and, and blogging. Um, what sort of what sort of effect has that had uh, on? Uh, has it increased um, the, the story being told through that medium? Um, I think the question was, what is the effect of this on the blogging and the fans? you know, online. And our hope is that it creates quite a bit of interest. And we have a deadline by 2013 when the America's Cup is being held. And so that's one of the reasons why we were able to convince, you know, management within the America's Cup Events Authority that the best value use of this data is to publish it openly. Because if we can use the data to bring more interest to the cup, that'll be, you know, the best return on the investment we've made in the data. And already there is quite a bit of um, discussion online. Typically it's in a, uh, a uh, forum called Sailing Anarchy. But there are folks there that tease through the data and compare tacking losses between boats and penalty payment and you know, upwind speeds. And, and it, it is attracting the sort of attention that the Major League Baseball pitch data you know, attracted um, in that sport. Thank you so much for everything, and it was a great presentation. Thank you, and please join me in thanking them.